Well, let's sort of firstly discuss how much happiness is determined by, by your circumstances, by your health, by your job, by where you live. Robert, you've sort of talked about that a little bit. Do you, do you want to make a specific comment about how much you reckon is circumstance dictated? Yeah, I, I would be happy to. Um, there, there's a, a pretty common notion that about 10% of, of your happiness is due to life circumstances. And I hate to start us off on a less than positive note by saying I disagree with that. Um, I, I think that at any given moment, a lot more than 10% of your happiness is determined by your circumstances. Sometimes 100% of your happiness is determined by your circumstances. So I think it's, it's interesting to look at what sort of average that science says across groups and across individual variability and, and what's specific to you in, in the given moment. So if you have the unfortunate luck of getting divorced, stepping on a landmine, uh, getting in a car accident. I think a whole lot of your happiness is determined for a very short period of time by, by those environmental events. Now having said that, I think that the, the human mind has an enormous capacity to, to make sense of those horrific events, to, to overcome them, if you will. Uh, and, and I think that, that somewhere in there is, is the interplay, but I'm, for myself, not comfortable just rushing to say, oh, circumstances really don't matter and it's, it's, we can just quickly get to the mind piece. I, Although I earlier on you were saying, you know, everyone would think people in Calcutta would be unhappy, people in America would be happy because of their circumstances, but as you said, not the case. Well, I did say that the circumstances affect their happiness. The, yeah. the people in Calcutta would be the first to tell you they want different circumstances. Yeah. And yet it doesn't rob them of their entire happiness. But it does raise their anxiety. So, so I think it's a, a somewhat complex story. Uh, Paula, do you have a view on, on whether you can assess how much of our happiness for many of us is dictated by, by where we are and what we're doing and how much is more within our control? Oh well, from a, from a, a scientific point of view, uh, if you if take your question literally, we can assess what are the factors that are impacting on a person, on a child, on a family at a certain point in time. But I'm a very strong believer um, that if you look at history, some people have gone through very, very difficult circumstances. If, uh, and I don't want to mention, I'd like to mention some random names, but I'll mention the ones I know really well, like Martin Luther King and Gandhi and Nelson Mandela. If you look at their lives, they weren't really that easy. They were very difficult circumstances, and they chose to stay mostly happy and react with events with the inner strength. And so I really think that um, some people go through uh, horrific life circumstances, and they choose to think, to feel, to behave, and to, to gather the resources around them that will make them strong. And I know it's a very hard task, and I personally have gone through some really difficult situations too. And it's always very easy to become negative and to become sick and to just give up on things. But if we choose the harder path, it, it, it is possible to choose to, choose to be strong. And when to be when you say choose, though, choose to me thinks there's two boxes, pick one. Um, is it... Is it really the case that we can all choose or are some people I th born with the uh, amount of the inner capacity the resilience to be able to choose whereas other of us aren't yeah well the, the best way of describing their question is that we all on a normal distribution it's like a mountain on a continuum and of course five percent of us are born very resilient or very positive or very good at sport or very good at maths and five percent with not that characteristic, whatever characteristic, but most of us are in the middle, nine, nine out of 10 of us, 90%, and we can learn the skills to be, make those choices. It doesn't mean you've already got those skills that to be a positive thinker, to be a healthy physical person in terms of physical health, mental health, but you, the point is that you can learn the necessary skills through programs that we know are very effective to become a more positive, a more, a psychologically healthier person, a happier person. We can learn those mm. skills. Francis, as part of, of your job, you've spent lots of time with people who've had very difficult things happen to them, whose circumstances have gone from okay to really bad. What do you think about that notion of, of us having a choice about how we 
react to, the, to bad things happening? Um, I think that each and every one of us has to work at being happy. Uh, I think, I don't know the percentages, but I, I do definitely think there is a, a percentage of effort and choice in your attitude uh, as to what either life throws at you or the path that you take and it leads you to a certain place. I think in its most very basic um, form, happiness is, is a choice. And I was just saying earlier, I came here by cab and when I got in the cab, the taxi driver said to me, oh, where are you off to, love? And I said, oh, I'm actually going to a happiness conference. And he looked at me and he went, oh, that's all we need. <laughs> <laughs> And I thought, you probably should be going to that conference, mate. <laughs> I think happiness is not, um, I think it's something that, sorry, you're right, James. I interview people who all of a sudden have gone from one minute being in a very happy family and the next minute maybe one of their children gets a terrible disease or they lose a leg in a horrible accident or something like that happens. Now... I agree with um, both. Sometimes circumstances are so damn horrible that you really, you know, you're going to have to work really, really hard to see the silver, mm. silver lining. And, and that there is a it, choice to either work hard or just give up. And, and isn't part of it accepting that th there is actually work to do? Not Absolute, saying, haven't yes. I been dealt a terrible hand, but saying, to get out of this... I've got to do so. I've got to climb the mountain that was in your cartoon. I'll come to you in a moment, Michael, but Robert, what do you think about this idea of working at happiness? Uh, I'm hugely in agreement, and I, I didn't mean to come off entirely negative before. I mean, I, I do no, think you didn't. that... you came that off that so just a bit negative. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Exactly, as planned. Because <laughs> um, while I do think that circumstances do dictate our, our immediate emotional reactions. I, I do think that we have enormous power to, to take control of our thoughts, take control of, of the attendant feelings and, and climb out of the, the mental hole as you were, even in dire circumstances. So, so I do think that, that happiness is an effortful mental process. Um, Michael, work isn't somewhere where we were meant to be happy, was it? It's where you go to earn a buck to spend on lollies to make you happy. Uh, you've done a great deal of work on trying to make your workplace happier. That's really been your, your aim. Uh, quite unusual amongst people in a capitalist economy. Uh, why and how have you done that? What a terrible thought that you spend more than 50% of your life at work and that it's not meant to be happy. Yeah. I suppose that uh, when you actually sit and think about it, you hear this saying about work-life balance. I actually have a view that that's a, uh, it's a phantom and it doesn't actually exist. I actually look at things as a, a continuum. So when I'm at home uh, helping my kids uh, doing their uh, Victorian poetry with uh, Robert Browning, I'm thinking about, from a communication point of view, what that means with the workforce. When I'm in front of the workforce trying to communicate, whether it's on safety or other aspects, I think about what that means uh, in relation to teaching my kids at home. When I'm visiting a foreign country where uh, you have language issues, you have to slow down, you have to be more precise in the way that you communicate. And uh, I think if you actually start to look at, at work as just part of an element of, uh, of life, it then changes your whole mindset because it opens so much opportunity. And uh, you know, on the issue of choice, I absolutely believe that in the workplace that you do have choice, but unfortunately we have mental blocks and people actually fall into stereotypes and norms about this is the way that we do things. And part of the enjoyment I get from trying to generate a, a more happier workplace is actually to, and it's a, it's a trite word in empower, but actually challenge people to see and ask why are they doing some of the things that are allegedly expected. And can, you, can you give us a couple of examples of that? Um, I'll give you an example. At, uh, we had a public holiday um, on Monday. And so we have to have uh, numbers uh, down in Brisbane by a certain date. And they said, well, we don't want people working on the public holiday. We'll change the timeline. Um, and so Tuesday lunchtime instead of Tuesday 8 o'clock was when we needed the numbers by. One of the sites struggled, and at 6.45 p.m. we eventually got the, uh, the numbers. And I just sat there and said, I'm looking for 13 numbers. Surely it can't be that difficult. 
<laughs> and when we sat down and we did an uh, analysis of what was going on, and I work in engineering companies, we've got some really smart engineers that make things so complex, so complicated, and by geez, it's unhappy. And again, just opening people's eyes and saying, why do we actually go down this path? Well, this is the way we've always done it, or the system makes us uh, do it. And I come back to the point of view and saying, you actually do have a choice. You can either be a prisoner to the system, or you can actually start to work within the system and see the opportunities. And purpose is a very interesting one. When you look at, uh, James talked about capitalist uh, organisations. If you go and have a look at vision statements, if you have a look at purpose, there's all of these things about returning value to the shareholder, uh, making lots of money and things like that. But really, I sit down as a leader and say, I reckon our role is to pro provide our people uh, with the opportunity to be in the place of most potential. And you can sit there and say that's philosophical and, uh, and airy-fairy, but if you think about it, if your people can actually position themselves, if you can actually generate the environment where they can be in the place of most potential. What do you mean by the place of most potential? That they can actually realise and uh, deliver the potential that each of us has inside, mm. whether it's from a, a physical, whether it's from a mental, whether it's from a thought point of uh, view, I reckon you've got a pretty powerful... So, for example, some people may say, well, you know, what do you want to achieve in life? I want to fulfil my potential in all ways. So you think work can be a part of that? Absolutely. Um, I mean, to me, work is all about relationships. And you can turn up to work and you say, I've got these outcomes or outputs that I need to put in place, but I actually can do it with the people around me. But we never actually really spend the time to invest to know the people that we work with to a large extent. We'll go in and we'll have a transactional conversation in relation to, we need this, how can you help me? How many people uh, in the work environment that actually take an hour out every week to take someone in the workplace that they don't know very well for an hour for coffee? To just chat, to understand the circumstances. And I tell you what, the, the richness, the diversity that that actually starts to bring out, the opportunities that you start to see are just unfounded. And it's actually a lot okay. of fun as well. Okay, I want to talk a bit about, or I want you to talk a bit about sort of practical things we can do to institutionalise changing our attitude, improving our attitude. Francis, you've done some work or, or you've wrote, written a wonderful article about gratitude journals. Can you tell us what they are and what, what, what they seem to do? Um, we did an article in Q Weekend and I believe Hayley, who was the young girl who started this project, is a speaker at this conference. Uh, she was just a, a young suburban mum and um, feeling a bit of um, suburban malcontent. Nothing, you know, she had a roof over her head, she had kids that she loved, her husband had a good job. So on the surface, you know, should be happy. This is what we're taught, particularly as women, wife, family, job, you'll be happy. Uh, but she wasn't happy and she couldn't work out why she wasn't happy and she fell into a depression and she went to visit, uh, she tried various things and it, it but, but she started She started keeping yes, a so gratitude journal, yeah. right? So uh, this journey of trying to work out how she was going to be happy led her to start this project um, very organically, just her and her Instamatic camera. And uh, she did 365 days of happiness, a year of happiness. And every day but the she Am I right in thinking the idea was every day she took a picture or, yeah. or she could have written something down, Both. something she was grateful for yeah, every day, that had happened yeah. that so day? So a Polaroid of a beautiful cup of hot chocolate and then she might write underneath it, steaming hot chocolate on a winter's day. Mm. Little things. And she said that just by virtue of actually physically and practically looking out for things, by shifting her subconscious to actually start actively looking for things to make her happy, We'll put it this way, at the beginning of the project, she found it hard to find things. By the end, she had too many. Now, the, the great thing about that is that it's very easy to say, I'm going to be more grateful for things, but you probably won't be. But to institutionalise in a very practical way, every day I'm going to write down something I'm grateful for, seems to me a more, uh, a more practical and likely to succeed option. From what you know, Paula and Robert, um, what do you think of that idea? I think it's great because I think that we have, uh, especially emotionally, a natural capacity to adapt to new events, very functional for us. It's the reason why you can get a, a new job, move across town, marry someone new, because you adapt to it. You're not always freaked out like, oh my God, it's my first day every single day. Eventually, you just get used to it and you can go along. 
but the downside of that natural tendency to adapt is that you start taking things for granted, right? Yeah. That that new dishwasher, which was a great time saver, and you kind of thought was nice, and you know, by day two, you're taking it for granted. And I think the the idea of cultivating a gratitude in a formal way is a natural counterbalance to that. It, it keeps you mindful, essentially. Uh, Paula, does it make sense to, to you? Yeah, well, that's that's what we do all the time uh, where I work at Pathways. Our programs is like standardized programs where every day the families that participate in them have got these particular s specific techniques either about emotional awareness or changing thinking, changing attention, forming support networks, and they record these things. The children learn either through play, depending on how old they are, and the adults record them, and it's a variety of, of strategies, including s very similar things to what you were talking about, uh, but uh, spanning across um, what, what I talked about, attachment techniques, emotional techniques, cognitive and behavioral, where they, they record these things and they develop specific skills on how to implement those strategies daily in their lives in within themselves, with their families, and with their communities at work or at school. So, and it works, because the research shows that even three years afterwards, five years afterwards, people still have those skills, even though they've gone through difficult times in their lives. And we're talking about people as young as four years of age. So when we do a program like the Fun Friends program with children, the research shows that years afterwards these children still know the skills. So it's possible to learn and it's it's actually quite easy, but you do have to invest the time. And you, I presume, would say that there is a opportunity for lots more or a place for lots more programs like that in our schools and that I they would, could make I a big would, difference. That would be my lifetime dream. Uh, yeah. they, they have happened in lots of other countries such as Canada, Norway, Finland, but uh, for some reason uh, our programs that are Australian developed, developed in Brisbane in this city, they are not in, uh, in all the schools, they're not part of the curriculum, but if they were, uh, the research shows that children, the families that would learn these programs, which is just once a week for couple of hours uh, for three months, so that doesn't take a lot of time, people would experience less levels of anxiety, less levels of depression, higher levels of happiness and work productivity or better behavior at school, better cognitive outcomes at school. All the research has shown that for the past 10, 15 years. Seven minutes left. I want, I want you each to give me two things. The second one is a way you want to improve your own thinking or the way your own mind works, but the first one is um, a, a practical thing, you've, and you've already mentioned a number of them, a practical thing that people can take away with them today, whether it's something for themselves, for the home, for the workplace, that they might be able to do that you think is a generally, you know, positive and good thing, um, thing to do. Robert? Savouring. I think what? Savouring. Savouring. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just came up with that. That's great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think savoring, especially uh, because it's something you can do with other people. Yeah. You can you can savor together, and I, I like that. But also, it's the flip yeah. side of gratitude. Like, gratitude is at the end of the day, and you think, oh, I really yeah. am appreciative of that, you know, cup of tea. But but savoring is when you're drinking the tea, yeah. isn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. It's just been right there with the cup of tea. That's gold. Um, a practical thing people can so do. Are we allowed to? You said two at the beginning. If they're quick. Because I don't know which one to choose. Okay, the okay. first one would be to everyone in this audience, and including myself, but I, I already do it, d dedicate one hour of your week on giving something to other people. So for me, it would be animal welfare. So go and give one hour of your week to those agencies, but it can be to elderly people, people in hospital, whatever cause you're passionate about the environment. And the other one is that everybody moves for one hour. And I'm talking about exercise. Yeah. You don't have to be a triathlete. Just walk for one hour every day. I guarantee after a month, you'll be happier. At the beginning, you'll just get aches on your knees and the excuses <laughs> are not to do it. But after a month, you are addicted and you're healthier and you're happier. That's one hour a day of Unless, walking. obviously, you're someone who's currently work, walking for two hours a day. Oh, but that's <laughs> then you'll be less happy. That is fantastic. Um, <laughs> okay, <laughs> Michael, happy. Uh, I, I'm guessing a workplace one. 
Yeah, I think, James, the, uh, the greatest present you can give people is being present. Uh, we have this scourge called uh, blackberries where people are mm. continually distracted. I must admit I find that uh, really disrespectful, whether it's meetings, uh, whether it's walking down the, the street. But even more fundamental, that uh, when you're attending meetings, uh, when you're going out to, to visit sites, there's all of these pressures that you have coming from directions and they're all pretty important. But if you're actually making the effort to go and visit people on the site, surely you should be making the effort to spend the time with them, not to be 20 or 30 per cent uh, present because unfortunately what I call the, the human bullshit meter, they pick up very quickly when people aren't being genuine, when people aren't being present and uh, you start to lose very quickly. So it's a, it's a sorry, simple thing you, but it's difficult to do. No, don't you do just that, repeat James. That? <laughs> sorry, I'm, I was distracted. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's a good one. Francis? <laughs> Uh, I would say um, I read a lot of quotes about happiness when I knew I was coming here today and none of them really resonated with me but then I was reading a novel two nights ago and a character said this and I thought, well, there you go, that's it and it's very basic and it said um, happiness is um, someone or something to love, something to do and something to look forward to. And I think if you could give yourself the gift of those three things somehow, some, some, someone or something, whether it's a human or an animal, to love, something to do, to be enthusiastic about, find something that makes you feel great, um, whether it's exercise or, or your work, and, and something to look forward to, even if it's little. Whether it's, for me, I can tell you right now, it's my cup of tea in bed at the end of a very long day in a book. Happiest and moment of my day. <laughs> and mine is... Um, directed mainly at myself, stop whinging and suck it up. Because um, we, we whinge so much. That's very English. Think, that's very English. <laughs> well, I know, I know you think that that might, that might be, you know, not all bad, but there's so much unproductive whinging and we've got so much and I have got to do less. Okay, one way you want to change your own mind to make it better. Robert? Uh, just recently I've started experimenting with unstructured time and spontaneity and curiosity. My, my entire Most day. of us did that when we were three. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I missed that entirely. I've just been structured the whole time. Um, so, so, you know, I have my own business. I've got kids. I've got my wife. You know, just my day is structured. I, I get out of bed and, and instantly just start working. And, you know, I tuck my kids in at the end of the day. And I really have to stop. So what I've done recently is, is I use birds um, because I live in the, the forest, the real forested area. So anytime there's a bird around of any type, hawk, little tiny robin, anything, I'll stop and watch it nice. for half a minute or something, just completely unstructured time, and let it interfere with whatever I'm doing. That's fantastic. I love it. Uh, very briefly, because we're almost out of ta uh, time, one, one way you want to improve yourself, Paul? Mine is similar to him because I've got a very similar life, like extremely uh, structured and targeted in terms of achieving goals and producing a lot and stuff. But uh, I'd really like to uh, remember to at least once a week look at the stars because we'll have stars at some point and at least once a, w once a week look at greenery and but really look, really be present like what you were saying and look at uh, this just natural beauty around me because we've got so much in Brisbane, so much natural beauty and having the time to actually really be there and present and realise it's there to to generate this sense of peace. Fantastic. Peace. Michael? Um, I think it's related to time. It's stopping doing and actually uh, valuing the moment and allowing some uh, free thoughts to, uh, to kick around. Francis? Uh, I actually need more structure. <laughs> more structure? <laughs> <laughs> I can <What>? help you. <laughs> to be honest, <laughs> I'm very good at enjoying the moment. I enjoy the moment <laughs> a little bit too much. <laughs> really? <laughs> All right, interesting. <laughs> what a great <laughs> and I, th I, ca um, I think mine is try and be outside more. I love being outside. There's this whole, like from about when I was 20 to when I was 35, I forgot that, I, that how great it is being outside, you know, mm. in, in nature. And, you know, and I was really ambitious and whatever. And now being outside, it just makes me feel better. So if I do that walking, it won't be on a treadmill. Please thank our panel, ladies and gentlemen, didn't they do a wonderful job?